Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first video lecture. We're going to be finishing up the term through this kind of format. Uh, if you've got any problems with the, the video in terms of the audio quality or uh, the visual quality or anything like that, please feel free to reach out to me and let me know. Um, I'm afraid you are stuck looking at my face if you're watching the video version. I've also posted audio files of this. So if your complaint with the video is simply that I'm in it, um, you can take some steps to try to mitigate that, but I'll leave that decision up to you. So through this technology, um, so I'm using the Zoom platform just at home with a webcam here uh, producing these. It's not gonna be anything particularly fancy and I don't have any video editing software. So anytime I slip up or make a goof or anything like that, it's just gonna have to stay in the video. So the videos are not going to be more polished than the lectures for that. I beg your forgiveness, though I'm sure you'll understand given the circumstances. So today I'm gonna take us through the heart material uh, that finishes off this three-part examination we have and this question about the, the limits of the criminal law and enforcing morality um, within the, the private sphere. So we looked at Mill, we looked at Devlin last week, uh, and then we we're supposed to look at Hart this past Monday, but of course classes got canceled. So we'll take a look at what Hart has to say today. I'll try to keep it fairly succinct. The slides I'm about to put up are posted on Moodle. I'll be posting my own slides for the rest of the term. Um, I've changed the schedule around, so we're gonna take a look at Hart today. We'll finish off our look at this unit um, that will also finish our look at any of the material that was uh, open for, for writing the second essay on. And then we've got two pieces left, uh, one from Will Wallachow and the other one from, um, oh, it's slipping my mind at the second, I'll, I'll just pull it up here, um, Waldron, Jeremy Waldron. So we're gonna be taking a look at constitutional law. Uh, I've just bumped that back a little bit, so next week, We'll just take a look at Waldron. The week after that, the final week, we'll take a look at Wallachow. That will conclude our course content. Uh, I'm still working on exactly what's gonna happen for the, the final exam. Right now I'm anticipating some sort of right at home final. Um, so we should still have some form of final exam. As promised before, it should still be cumulative in some sense. Uh, I'm still working on exactly what format the, the different sorts of questions are gonna have and expect to be writing an essay on there on the, the Waldron Wallachow issue. So expect to write an essay on the exam on constitutional law, which we're gonna be looking at next week and the week after. So with that, I'll just go ahead and switch over to the slideshow here. Um, so, all right, I'll just get this, take a moment to adjust this. All right. Ooh, I think, at least on my end, my shirt all of a sudden looks very funny. I feel like I'm in some kind of weird 80s uh, uh, music video, and I kind of like it. So hopefully that's not too distracting. If it is, I don't know, just sort of put some tape up on the end of the, your monitor or something like that. So Hart's piece here, Law, Liberty, and Morality, uh, this is actually a short book. You can, you can still buy it. That Hart wrote on the same subject that Devlin was writing about. So they're both interested in this question about whether or not the law should be used to enforce public morality, right? Uh, or a community's morality or a society's morality. I'm using those terms just synonymously here. We saw Devlin's answer last week. Devlin says, yes, of course. Uh, why? Because what a society is really is determined by its, its moral code, by having some kind of shared public morality that you have a society in the first place. And a society has a right to defend itself. Devlin makes the analogy to treason. He says, just like a society has every right to defend itself against treasonous activity, it has a right to defend itself against immoral behavior because that immoral behavior threatens the society's existence. This is really, in a nutshell, his argument. We're gonna take a look at Hart, who disagrees with Devlin. Uh, we're gonna see how that unfolds here. One note, just before I forget to mention that, I did mention this when we were looking at Devlin. On page 350 of our text, Devlin has a rather large footnote, it takes up about half of that whole page, where he is responding to what Hart is saying here in Law, Liberty, and Morality. Uh, I, I might come back to that, but we're gonna see Hart objects to Devlin's 
saying that uh, what a society is is really determined by its shared morality. Um, and, and we're, Hart criticizes Devlin on the score. Devlin responds to that in this note here. So part of what's going on between Hart and Devlin, there's this, this sort of synchronous debate they have where they're both responding to this Wolfenden report. They've got these differing views on the nature of law and they're, they're writing and presenting their views and they know what the other one's saying. And so it gets worked in because if you read the Hart piece, you'll see he's talking about what's in the Devlin piece. And in Devlin's piece, he's talking about what's in the Hart piece. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, debate to see unfold in real time in some sense. You can see the, the exchange of cannon fire, so to speak, between the two of them. All right, so what's going on in this heart piece? There's, there's a lot of interesting material. Um, of course, we really wanna dig through the details. There's all sorts of fun stuff we could say, but I'll try to keep it brief and, and stay relatively on point and just get through the main concepts here. So Hart is interested in exploring this question. Ought immorality as such be a crime? Now he states this on 359, uh, and he puts this question in three different ways. So the editors actually make this insertion um, on, on 359 in the section positive and critical morality. They give two other formulations of the question, and th those other formulations are this. Is the fact that certain conduct is by common standards immoral sufficient to justify making that conduct punishable by law? Is it morally permissible to enforce morality as such? And of course, the third version, ought immorality as such be a crime? So these are three ways that Hart himself puts this question. The editors just stick it in there so you've, you've got it. Uh, I'm just gonna stick with the third formulation because it's the simplest, ought immorality as such be a crime? That is, should it be illegal to do something that the society around you or the community around you or, or the public considers to be immoral. Whatever that might be. In this particular instance, what Hart and Devlin are really discussing is the question of homosexual acts between consenting adults carried out in private. That's really their, their topic question. There's also questions about prostitution, some other things, but you can take that as the, the focus of the debate really. But of course, that's just one particular issue. Hart and Devlin are interested in the much broader question of, of what sorts of general principles can we invoke to help make up our minds and, and give coherent, consistent answers in all such cases. And so in some sense, they're, they're doing good philosophy. Here's this particular debate going on. They say, okay, well, to answer that debate, let's try to seek out some general principles that would give us justifiable reason to answer one way rather than another, and then consistently use those principles to answer all relevant questions. So there's three features to this question Hart thinks are worth outlining. First feature, this question, right, ought immorality as such be a crime, and the other formulations of it, are moral questions about morality. These aren't just questions of fact, right? It's not a question of, as a matter of fact, uh, are acts considered to be immoral outlawed by communities and is the weapon of the law used to enforce it using Devlin's phrase? Uh, as Hart freely admits, of course, they have been for almost time and memorial, as long as there have been law codes, uh, they've been used to enforce certain moral features, or uh, um, certain behaviors that are considered to be moral or immoral. So there's a feature of the behavior, a moral feature. So it's a moral question we've got in our hands, and it's a moral question about morality, right? Is it moral to enforce morality through law? And we saw this was very much Devlin's question as well. So Hart and Devlin are interested in the same thing. Second, this is a question of justification. Right? Under what conditions are we justified in punishing someone for their behavior or in coercing people's behaviors via the threat of punishment? Hart notes that there are these two dimensions to the question. So there's the, the question on the one hand of, can we justify actually punishing someone, taking away their liberty or their property um, or, or something like that or physically hurting them in some kind of way as an act of punishment. Are we justified in doing that to particular people based on what they do? Are we also justified in coercing what people do from the mere threat of punishment that looms over them? So there are these two dimensions to it, but they're both questions of justification, which in some sense really overlaps with question one. It's a moral question. Questions of justification are primarily moral questions. Third, 
Hart puts it this way, he sort of dances around the third point a little bit, but this is really what he's getting at. What is crucial to the dispute is the significance to be attached to the historical fact that certain conduct, no matter what, is prohibited by a positive morality. Here again, so he's got these three features, three in a lot of ways overlaps with the first two. So here again, he's admitting this historical fact that just as a matter of fact in the world we live in, humans have used law to outlaw certain conduct, to prohibit certain things, to in some sense enforce or make obligatory other sorts of moral actions. So it's this question, what significance do we attach to that fact? Or how important is that? Because of course Devlin points to that fact and Hart himself points to it as well and says, well, here are some different examples of, of how we can see this happening in American and, and English law and you know, throughout history and so on. But why does it matter? If we're talking about morality, why does the fact that that's how it's been done really matter? So for instance, you know, if we were having, say we lived in a society that held slaves and we're debating whether or not slavery should be illegal or illegal, merely pointing to the fact that it's currently legal and that there are slaves being held doesn't itself answer the question whether or not we ought to allow slavery. Right? Now, of course, pointing to the fact that it is allowed or is not allowed can in some sense be important. That could be evidence in an argument. But there's a real question of what do we make of that evidence? So, in that third point, Hart was drawing on this distinction between positive and critical morality he makes. So what's the difference? Well, positive morality is much like positive law. What he's talking about is really positive morality. What's actually, as he puts it, actually accepted and shared by a given social group. The positive here in positive morality isn't positive versus negative. It's not positive in the sense, oh, it's a good thing. It's positive just like legal positivists are really talking about positive law what's actually been put out and called law, what's been articulated as law by certain sources and so on. We can contrast positive morality, the morality actually accepted and shared by a given social group, that's a kind of sociological question, it's, it's just a fact, with critical morality. Now critical morality are the general moral principles used in the criticism of actual social institutions, including positive morality. You can think of critical morality much like philosophical morality, very broadly construed. When you're doing philosophical ethics, generally speaking, you're reaching for certain general moral principles and using those to criticize certain practices and beliefs, what people actually believe, what people actually do, how institutions actually operate and so on. He gives the example of a utilitarian doing this sort of thing. Of course, you need not be a utilitarian. You could be a, a Kantian and do this sort of thing. You'd be an Aristotelian. You'd be a feminist. Uh, now, there's an interesting question there because feminists in some sense object to the use of general moral principles, but arguably we could reformulate our objection in terms of a general moral principle, right? General moral principle, not to use general moral principles. That's not supposed to just be a cheap shot of feminist ethics. I realize that might come off that way, but this is really what Hart is appealing to. In some sense, especially for the time he's writing in the 50s, just general philosophical approaches to morality. It doesn't necessarily matter what people actually think is right and wrong. If we can, develop and defend good, coherent, general moral principles, and then use that to develop some kind of system which we can then use to criticize what's actually going on. And when he's appealing to the utilitarians, people like Mill and Bentham, this is exactly what they were doing. They developed general moral principles, such as the principle of utility, developed that into a system, and used it to coherently and forcefully criticize the moral principles being used in the society around them, 19th century Britain. They criticized what people actually believed, what people actually did, how the law functioned, how social institutions worked, by appealing to a different set of moral standards. So this is really the distinction that Hart has in mind here. So there's positive morality, people actually believe, then critical morality, the sorts of principles we can invoke to criticize those beliefs. Now, Hart makes an assumption. He puts this earlier in the piece. I'm quoting him from near the end of it here, just because he, he puts it very clearly near the end. He assumes the critical principle that human misery and the restriction of freedom are evils. What does he mean here? Well, much like Mill, what Hart has in, in mind is that there is an onus or a burden of proof on those who want to restrict our freedom. 
Restricting freedom itself is a kind of evil, which can be justified in different sorts of ways. We can appeal to either something like abstract rights. People have a right to be free and make decisions that regard their own behavior or something like this. Or like Mill, you can appeal to utility. Um, we should only restrict people's freedoms when we have good reason. Why? Because being free is more likely to make them happier, all things considered. So there's different ways of, of trying to approach it, but just generally speaking, the onus is on the person who wants to restrict freedom rather than on the person who wants the freedom. And human misery is a bad thing. Now, in some sense, that seems like it should go without saying. Um, yeah, part of, and, and I might be stretching here a little bit, but I, I think it's probably worth saying, just that point that human misery is an evil. In some sense, it's always been recognized, uh, but it's really the utilitarians in the 19th century that made this such a, a, a focused moral issue, that in fact, human misery is a terrible thing and we ought to do what we can to try to get rid of it. And if actions result in human misery, then we ought to think twice about doing them unless we can see how, in some sense, they work in the long run to reduce humans. So Hart just assumes these things, I think most of you will think he's right here. Not necessarily. You could always call that assumption into question, but it's a, an assumption that Hart is going to be running with in this piece. Right? So that's sort of in the background for him. So the burden of proof is on the person who wants to restrict liberty or cause human misery to show why it's justified. That's going to be important when he's criticizing Devlin. Okay, so we've got this distinction between positive and critical morality in our back pocket. Now, where does Hart head? Well, he goes back and talks a little bit more about this fact that when we take a look at law, and specifically he has English and American law in mind, that those legal systems actually enforce morality in some sense. That there are laws enforced, particularly criminal laws, that prohibit certain kinds of behavior, not because there's any identifiable harm that's produced by those behaviors, but simply because those behaviors are deemed to be immoral by the public moral code of those societies. Right? So in some sense, instances that run contrary to Mill's harm principle. If we were trying to use Mill's harm principle and we examine these moral codes, we would find restrictions on individual freedom that violate that principle. Now, Hart himself admits that Mill is sort of wildly optimistic about what people are really like and that they know what's best for them and are rational agents and can make decisions in their own best interests and such. Now, I haven't put that on the slides. It's a very interesting point where Hart's going over this. Uh, he even criticizes Mill a little bit for, in some sense, projecting uh, Mill's image of what it's like to be a, a human sounds an awful lot like Mill himself, sort of middle-aged, fairly well-to-do, privileged, white male, 19th century. Um, Hart engages in this on 362, 363, if you're interested in taking a look at it. I think that would be an interesting topic to bring up in a paper. So we have this fact, English and American law enforce morality, but should they? This is really the question. Can we justify those restrictions or not? Now, thinking back to Devlin, and of course, Hart is engaging with Devlin, Devlin argues, yes, of course they should. Why? Well, um, this goes back to what I've already mentioned in this video and, and we talked about before. It has to do with the way Devlin conceives of a society overall. So Hart talks about where Devlin is pointing to consent. And if you remember this when we talked about Devlin, Devlin says, look, obviously we don't actually use Mill's harm principle because there are certain actions, such as murder or, or assault, where consent is no defense. Right? If you kill somebody and you say, well, they consented to it, it doesn't constitute a defense. It's, it's still classified as a murder, right? or at least it certainly used to be. Now that we are in the legal terrain where euthanasia is legal under certain circumstances, and only certain circumstances. So because of that fact, that consent is not a defense for any kind of action that would harm somebody else under actual English law, Devlin says, well, look, the only explanation is that English law enforces morality. We think things like assault and murder are bad things, and we use the law to enforce that uh, and make sure that people don't violate the moral code of the public. 
But Hart disagrees with this, this analysis of the fact that English law actually prohibits certain forms of activity, even if it's between consenting adults. Minimally, Hart says, there's really sort of a false dichotomy here. Devlin is saying either we're using the harm principle or we're enforcing morality, and that's it, right? There's, there's no middle ground, there's no third option. Hart says, well, but that's just false. In fact, Mill himself deals with this sort of issue, and he says, look, part of what a, a legal system might be doing is just trying to be paternalistic. It's not necessarily enforcing morality, but it's trying to act in the best interests of its subjects. Thinking back to what I was just mentioning about Hart criticizing Mill for being sort of optimistic about human nature, Hart says, look, we can uh, try to justify a paternalistic law, not just by appealing to morality, but we can try to appeal to certain rights themselves, might be part of a morality, maybe not, maybe they're somehow independent. Uh, so we could try to appeal either to rights or by appealing to utility. This was a distinction I was bringing up just a few moments ago, right? If we're saying people really ought to be free, we could try, you know, as free as possible in the decisions they make, we can try to justify that position by appealing to some kind of right. We, we have a right to be as free as possible or something like that. Or we can appeal to utility. Just as a matter of fact, people are happier when they're free. And if that wasn't the case, right, if we could actually make them happier by um, making certain decisions for them, then in fact, they shouldn't be free to make decisions that are gonna be bad for them. This is a way to justify paternalistic behavior. Mill himself argues in On Liberty that just as a matter of fact, utility overall in the largest possible sense in the long run is best served by uh, eliminating paternalistic laws. But that's a claim of fact, right? And it's a controversial claim of fact. Hart here is interjecting saying, well, look, given that Mill's uh, uh, view of human nature is sort of through rose-tinted glasses, maybe some paternalistic laws really are justifiable given human fallibility and, and our limited natures. And Hart points to an example of, say, laws prohibiting certain sorts of drug use. Okay, so this is really Hart's analysis of the fact that English and American law enforce morality. Devlin moves a little bit too quickly in trying to draw from that some kind of conclusion that just as uh, that we are justified in um, using the law to enforce morality, because at least he thinks what these examples are showing that, as a matter of fact these different legal systems use the law to enforce morale. Right. Um, I, I, I misspoke as I was saying that. At this point, Devlin's only really arguing that second point, and this is what Hart is engaging with, which is that, as a matter of fact, the law is enforcing morale in these sorts of cases. There's a separate question about whether or not the law is justified in doing it, which Devlin also thinks is the case. But here, it's Devlin's analysis about whether or not the law currently is enforcing morality that Hart's taking issue with. Okay, now that's, that's clear, I hope. So, what next? Well, there are these two theses that Hart articulates as being defended by people like Devlin, as well as there's another person that I'm just not really gonna talk about much, um, who argued very similarly to Devlin, but in uh, um, an earlier time, Mm, was that Stephen? Uh, Judge Stephen. Uh, let's talk about it on page three fifty eight, where he uh, puts it down. James James Fitz James Stephen. That's what it was. Um, and so Hart says, "All right, we get these arguments from some people over time, arguing for the conclusion that, in fact, yes, we should use the law to enforce morality, and that it's it's morally acceptable to do so." That can come in two different forms. One form is the moderate thesis, which is the uh, Hart formulated this way. A shared morality is the cement of society. Without it, there would be aggregates of individuals, but no society. Right? Really, a shared morality is the thing that makes a bunch of people, just some set of people, some collection of people, actually brings them together and makes them a community of some sort, makes them a society, makes them one. So there's always this next question, what is it to be Canadian, right? What, what is it that Canadians share that, that make us 
a society. On this view, a shared morality. Interesting question if there is such a morality, but this is the idea. Then there's the extreme thesis. The enforcement of morality is regarded as a thing of value, even if a moral acts harm no one directly or indirectly by weakening the moral cement of society. So uh, the way Hart is trying to put this together, so this is 363, 364, where he's trying to distinguish between these two theses. Um, on the moderate thesis, there's really this descriptive claim about a shared morality being what? binds a society together. Now, from that, from the fact that it's a shared morality that makes a society, what Devlin really extracts from that is the conclusion that a society has the right to defend itself by ensuring that its shared morality is um, uh, defended, right? It's not eroded or undermined by moral behavior. Now, the extreme thesis is really that we're right in all cases to enforce morality even if no harm is being done at all, uh, and even if people acting immorally, you know, say in private when nobody ever finds out about it, even doesn't have an indirect on, on society by weakening that shared moral code. So it's really a question of, of how extreme of a position do we want to have here. Now, Hart himself says that Devlin appears to defend the modern thesis. Right? That's, that's what Devlin seems to be defending. That's what it sounds like he's defending in most places. But as Hart notes, Devlin sort of slips a little bit, and it almost sounds like we, we wind up getting the extreme thesis. Why? Well, I already talked about this last time. When Devlin is trying to defend society's ability to enforce morality, really out of, of um, you know, self-protection, self-interest, it's a kind of self-defense society has. There's an existential threat to society because if it's moral, uh, posed by a moral behavior, because if it tolerates a moral behavior, that is going to undermine the shared moral code, which is actually going to loosen the bonds of society and ultimately destroy the society. Now, how does Devlin actually defend this claim? Well, this is where I think Hart really puts his finger on it. He says, just like I said, Really, what's Devlin doing? Fallaciously appealing to what he just calls history, right, as a kind of authority, that when immoral behavior is tolerated, and immoral behavior, in Devlin's words, sin, broadly speaking, uh, really any behavior that's considered to be immoral or intolerable by the society shared moral code, whatever it happens to be. Right? So if you have a society that thinks, I don't know, chewing bubblegum is immoral and, and ought not to be tolerated and it's just terrible, um, and they feel strongly enough about it. And of course, for Devlin, this would have to read the level of disgust, not merely uh, a sort of being uncomfortable about it. Then it follows that that society is right to make illegal the chewing of bubblegum. Now, what's going on in Devlin's case that Hart's really putting his finger on is that Devlin's not providing any empirical evidence that, as a matter of fact, immoral behavior leads to the decline and dissolution and disintegration of a society because its moral code is given up on. In particular, if we're thinking about decriminalizing homosexual behavior in private, which is really the topic they're interested in, then there's really no evidence at all that's marshaled and, and provided to show that tolerating that kind of behavior in the sense of not making it a, a criminal activity, there's just no evidence provided at all by Devlin that that actually somehow undermines uh, the society's moral code and leads to the dissolution of society. Now, Hart himself raises a point I didn't put here on the slides, but it's worth keeping in mind just on this particular topic, which is that the way Devlin treats morality and, and moral codes generally is, as Hart puts it, as a seamless web. This is on 364. Um, Really, morality and, and moral issues generally and the views people have on them aren't some seamless web. It doesn't just come as a package. It's not like society's morality is this one thing, and this one thing will be threatened if we allow disagreement about it. Just as a matter of fact, this is my way of putting it, but this is really Hart's point. Morality is a whole set of issues, 
we've got all sorts of different questions, right? Is homosexual activity in private, you know, right or wrong? Is it even a moral issue at all? Is telling little white lies because they, they make people a little bit happier, is that right or wrong? Right? Um, if you see somebody in, in distress, are you obligated to help them? Or are you just doing something very nice if you do, but you're not doing anything wrong by not doing it? All of these are separate moral questions. They might relate to one another. They also might not. We might have incoherent views on morality, right? We might disagree on all sorts of things. Perhaps we've got broad agreement on a number of important questions and then broad disagreement on a number of other questions, right? Which may or may not be very important. Whether or not the questions are important themselves can change over time. Hart's point here is that Devlin is treating morality as this one thing. He's making it very simple, right? And then appealing to history as a way of trying to justify defending that one simple unified thing. Hart says that's just not what it's like. And so if you want to make a claim, like in this instance, that some particular kind of activity will lead to the dissolution of society or pose some kind of existential threat to a society, if it's not regulated by the law, you have to provide some kind of evidence to actually support that empirical claim. Of course, if you want to just take it as a priori, and this is really how Hart puts it with Devlin, you know, you just take it as a, a matter of principle. You don't need experience, you don't need evidence, right? It's just some kind of principle um, imbued in us because of our rational nature, or given to us by God, or something like that. Well, sure, you can make that argument, but that argument might not be very convincing. But if you want to make an argument, as Devlin seems to be doing, that history shows us this, that the world we live in is like this, then you've got to actually provide some kind of evidence. So this really leads into Hart's um, other criticism of Devlin here, which is that Devlin treats a society is being coextensive with its shared public morality. The way, and this is exactly what Devlin is responding to in his footnote and, and saying back to Hart, I don't believe that, right? That is not my view at all. So if you want to engage in this, if you want to write the, the essay on this topic, this is an interesting point of tension between the two about who's really right. So this could be uh, an area to really have some kind of discussion in, in, in the paper. It's not an area you have to necessarily, but it's certainly one that's, that's ripe for engaging with. So Devlin really treats a society as being the same thing as its shared morality. Without the shared morality, you don't have a society, you just have a whole bunch of different individuals. Hart says, this leads us to something absurd, namely that we can't say a society's moral code has changed over time. Just take England as an example. If you wanna say, Right, like let's just say right now, back 1950s uh, England had certain sorts of moral attitudes. Moral attitudes today are different. The moral attitudes in England were probably different in, oh, let's just call it 1720, when they were in 2020. Well, if those attitudes have changed enough that it's no longer the same shared morality, they don't think the same things are right, the same things are wrong, then in fact, we can't talk about English society at all. The English society of 1720 is gone, and it is literally a different society that now exists. Because if you don't have the same shared morality, you just don't have the same society, according to Devlin. Hart says, it's just stupid, right? That's absurd, it's, it's ridiculous. It's not the shared moral code that makes for a society. That might perhaps be part of it, if we're looking um, at a certain time, but even there, Hart's not even giving that ground, at least not in our reading here. It's something else that makes a, a group of individuals really a society. What might that be? Hart doesn't give us an alternative suggestion, but we could, we could posit a few. Could be some sense of shared history, uh, just self-identification and group membership, right? What makes us all Canadian? That we say that we are, right? That we think that we are. We, we feel that way and we make decisions based on it. Right? Sociologists, um, think in these terms quite often. So it could be something like that, sense of shared history, just self-identification, uh, group membership. Perhaps there is something about some kind of shared uh, uh, experience, right? Geographical similarity, economic interdependence, being subject to the same set of laws, perhaps. 
my positivist like heart might particularly like that kind of suggestion. So there are other things that might make for society. There's also a, a nihilistic answer, which I'm just going to put out there. I don't expect any of you to, to pick it up. Uh, the answer is just there is no such thing as a society. Right? It's a very convenient fiction that we all invent to make things tick along for us in, in an easier way. We can comprehend societies in the world, even at that with all of the different countries in the world. I doubt any of you, and certainly not me, could actually list all of just the countries in the world right now. So let alone think about all the different societies that might be within different countries, right? And all of the disagreement variation within those societies. There are billions of people and we just cannot make sense of that much plurality given our limited cognitive faculties. So it's a kind of convenient fiction to talk about societies, right? what holds them together. But I'll, I'll shelf that for now. I just wanted to share that with you as a thought. So what do we have here? Really Hart's last point, is just this. So Devlin really fallaciously treats a society as the same thing as its shared morality, which seems goofy. Let's just assume for the sake of argument, Devlin was actually right. A society is just identifiable and, and coextensive with its shared morality. Well, there's a question that Devlin never raises, but we need to raise if we're thinking of this in moral terms, which is should all society have a right to exist in the first place. So Devlin's right about the rest of his argument. It's a shared public morality that makes for a society. Right? As a matter of empirical fact, if a society allows, or, you know, legally allows for immoral behavior, that's going to erode and undermine its public morality, which is ultimately going to lead to the disintegration, and if you want to think about it in biological terms, death of the society. So, Devlin concludes, just like an individual has a right of self-defense, so too does a society. Just like we allow it to defend itself against treasonous activity, we also should allow it to defend itself against immoral activity, which can be just as threatening. Hart questions that last step. Are you sure? Do all societies really have a right of self-defense? Think about it. He's, he, and he mentions, and he brings up some examples like we have been in class. What about a society committed to something like apartheid or uh, racial segregation? What about a society committed to, in its public morality, the subjugation of women right? uh, or allowing slavery? Do those sorts of societies have a right to self-defense, a right to exist that they can exercise by making illegal certain forms of conduct? Hart's answer is no. Right? In, in fact, there are situations where the society doesn't have that kind of right. If we take the analogy back to the individual case, we think that an individual has a right of self-defense. Right? Somebody else is attacking them. Normally, you, you can't harm somebody else, right? physically harm them. Uh, but if it's in self-defense, you can. There's an exception here. Now imagine this scenario. We wind up in court, you, know, you and me. Uh, you've harmed me, and I'm suing you somehow. Right? Where it could be a, a private suit I'm bringing for damages, or maybe it's just sort of a criminal case here. I was like, well, look, you hurt, you hurt me, so I'm owed damages, or you should go to jail, or something like that. Now, that defense will work if you attack me un unprovoked, right? But imagine this. We go in, and I make this case in front of the judge. Well, they attack me, so they owe me money, or you should put them in jail, or whatever it is. And the judge turns to you and says, so, did you, did you hurt him? And you say, yeah. And she says, well, why? Like, what, what was the situation? And you respond, well, there I was minding my own business when Carl burst in with a knife, threatening to kill me, and he ran over and started stabbing me and actually cut me in several places. So I fought back and I punched him in the face and I knocked him out. Right? I can't claim self-defense if you're already defending yourself against my unprovoked attack. We carry this back to the question of societies. If, in fact, societies are unjustly causing misery and restricting human freedoms, right, things that are evil, as Hart just assumed earlier on, right, we, we saw that early on, he brings this up in the conclusion on the last page of the piece. If the societies are doing things that are evil, and the society itself is evil, 
perhaps it doesn't have a right to exist in the first place. If it has no such right to exist, then it can't have a right of self-defense either. Can it? This ultimately is how Hart closes the argument against Devlin. So we can see that Hart challenges Devlin really every step of the way from what the matters of fact really are, what's really going on in the law, to what we can draw from those facts, and ultimately to this conclusion about whether or not society is justified in enforcing morality, and in particular, whether or not society is justified in keeping criminal homosexual behavior in private between consenting adults, which is ultimately the, the main subject that they're interested in discussing as a particular case, although they're also very interested in broadly speaking, what sorts of principles apply in this case, and so should apply to other cases like it. All right, that takes me to the end of what I want to say about Hart. So hopefully this was nice and succinct. I'll post these slides that I went through here on our Moodle site, so you're gonna have easy access to that. The audio from this is also on that site, which I realize now is redundant to tell you if you've already been listening to the audio. Uh, and I mentioned this back at the start. And if you've got any questions or, or comments about the video or anything, please feel free to contact me. Oh, now I sound like a YouTube personality. Like and subscribe. No, don't, don't do that. Don't, I dare you not to like the video. Dislike it. Is there a dislike button? I don't know. I'm too old. I'm not even that old. I'm just out of touch. Okay. I'm obviously spiraling, so I'm going to stop it here. I'll be back next week uh, with... Uh, a video or, or maybe two, I might do it in two installments, I haven't quite decided yet, on the Waldron piece. So I hope you're all doing well and feel free to reach out to me if you've got any questions about uh, what we just covered here. Have a good day.